Australian farmers fear the fallout from the breakdown of international trade talks. Infertile Australian couples heading to America to find surrogate mothers and Russian rumblings fail to ground our biggest ever air show. From National 9 News, this is Nightline with Jim Whaley. Good evening. Australian farmers are worried they'll be the innocent victims of a renewed international trade war as the consequences of the breakdown in vital talks ricochet around the world. We're not directly involved in the negotiations between the United States and the European community, but we'll be hit hard if the Americans and Europeans stick to and even increase tariffs and subsidies. The farmers are blaming France and have appealed to consumers to boycott French products on sale here. Peter Harvey has this report. The general agreement on tariffs and trade, GATT, ended up agreeing on nothing. A decade of attempts to stop the European community and the United States dumping heavily subsidized farm produce onto world markets collapsed overnight. American negotiators walked out, accusing the EC of giving in to French demands that subsidies continue. We are going to see an escalating trade war between the United States and the Europeans, and that will be extremely damaging to Australia's interests. The vast bulk of Australian agriculture is exported. This country is being damaged more than most by subsidised American and European goods flooding our traditional markets. The GATT talks were our last best chance of getting a fair go. We're tremendously bitter and frustrated. Australian farmers say it's time to hit back. Gat. Unions and consumers should target French goods. Now I, for one, as an Australian, certainly won't be purchasing French products. Uh, we hope that other consumers will express their indignation and their disgust at the French actions by taking uh, similar actions themselves. The opposition wants much greater emphasis on trade with Asia and tough action to stop uh, Europe dumping to, products uh, here. Where Australia for too long has been a soft touch for food imports into this country. The Europeans are the real enemy. The dilemma for Australia, though, is posed not only by the Europeans, the Americans have served notice that they'll continue to sell into our markets as long as the Europeans do. Peter Harvey reporting for Nightline. Victorian Premier Jeff Kennett has blamed the previous state Labor government for the decision by Moody's to downgrade the state's debt rating. It's been dropped from AA2 to A1, the lowest rating of any Australian state. The government has vowed to take strong budgetary action to restore the state's standing. And more trouble in Victoria, with unions calling a statewide strike for November the 10th over industrial relations reforms. Premier Kennett has appealed to 800,000 state workers to ignore the strike call. A Sydney woman has been murdered in the same house where a relative was raped at knife point last week. 32-year-old Felicitas Pentoia was found slumped in the hallway of her, of her St Peter's home. Police fear the same person may be responsible for both attacks. They released this identical picture of the man wanted for questioning. South Australian police have recalled their speed cameras for testing. The order followed a row over their reliability, including claims a power pole was photographed travelling at 73 kilometres an hour. South Australians are calling for a refund of fines of up to $20 million. Two suspected thieves got more than they bargained for in Brisbane today, a citizen's arrest. Six people chased the two men through the streets, surrounding them and holding them until police arrived. The pair had allegedly stolen thousands of dollars from a caravan yard in Chermside. Infertile Australian couples are turning to America to find surrogate mothers because of laws preventing such arrangements here. A Los Angeles clinic has already organised women to bear children for at least 12 Australian couples and another four babies are on the way. A Los Angeles clinic takes delivery of another frozen embryo from Australia. To the frozen embryos from Mrs Smith. Okay. In the next few days, the embryo will be implanted into the uterus of a surrogate Californian mother. Infertile Australian couples are turning to a company in Beverly Hills to find them a surrogate willing to carry their child. Uh, these photos show a few of the 231 babies that we've had in our program born to date. And every one of these children went to the parents. 
Australians are proving to be some of the centre's most popular clients. Recently, four Australian couples signed onto the program, undaunted by the cost, up to $90,000 per baby. This woman from Bakersfield, California, was implanted with an embryo provided by a Melbourne couple. I carried her nine months and gave birth with the parents there. Most of the money goes to the doctors and consultants. Shirley's share was just $10,000 for nine months' work. <laughs> it's not my egg. I provided the house, and that was it. The couple returned home to Melbourne with their healthy child, happy in the knowledge the entire procedure is legal in California, unlike Australia. Somebody in the Australian administration called up the Ayatollah and said, what do you think of this? Okay, that sounds good to me. That's going to be the way we look at it. But until the laws change in Australia, the chance of having a child will be limited to only those infertile couples rich enough to afford it. In Los Angeles, Mark Burrows for Nightline. Coming up on Nightline, the sneaky investigation of Bill Clinton's mother and the former nuclear test site where the locals want the Big Bangs back. There was a cloud hanging over the big air show in Melbourne today when the Russians issued a last-minute ultimatum. Their military contingent refused to fly unless it was given free fuel. In the end, organizers struck a deal. Jason Cameron has details. Ever since the Russians arrived, air show organizers have been in a state of confusion and frustration. But at least these aircraft are here. This Antonov's twin with its cargo of MiG-29 fighters hasn't turned up at all. Also breaking a written agreement are the star performers of the Russian team, the Sukhoi fighters. They called up to say they couldn't make it. And that's not the end of the story. Behind the scenes, the Russians have been crying poor, asking for free fuel. That request was refused, and the aircraft have stayed grounded until a deal was done. They may or may not have flown, but this uh, deal has certainly made it absolutely certain that they will. I've received a, an undertaking from the senior Russian general in charge of their delegation that they guarantee that they'll be flying. And just to prove the point, two giant Russian helicopters, freshly topped up with cut-price fuel, took to the air late today to demonstrate some of the manoeuvres they'll be performing over the weekend. Relations with Russia's non-military contingent are much smoother. Manufacturers of the Aleutian commercial jetliner had a busy day which included welcoming the US ambassador. They also announced plans to equip their jumbo-sized airliner with American engines and cockpit and Western standard levels of passenger comfort. But while the Russians are anxious to talk about their illusion to anyone who'll listen, it's the giant wide-bodied cargo freighter, the Antonov, parked right next door, that's really pulling in the crowds. Because of the refueling dispute, the Antonov hasn't taken off yet, and as you'd imagine, it's got a big thirst. But we're promised faithfully that it will fly both tomorrow and Sunday, and the Russians will pay in US dollars. In America, the trial is underway of a Qantas flight steward accused of buying cocaine to smuggle into Australia. 32-year-old Stephen James from Clavelli in Sydney was arrested at Hermosa Beach 10 months ago. Police seized almost two kilograms of cocaine from a carry bag in his car. Several Qantas staff have been called to give evidence tomorrow. If found guilty, James could be jailed for seven years. Well, what would a presidential election be without a few dirty tricks? It now seems that not only was Bill Clinton's past raked over by the U.S. State Department, it also investigated his mother. Rumors of something fishy in Clinton's anti-war days prompted the original request for the files. The State Department jumped on it, perhaps improperly, it later said, but nothing was found and nobody said anything about Clinton's mother. Today's Washington Post reported that the search did include her under past married names, Virginia Dell Blythe and Virginia Dell Clinton. Now it turns out that the State Department was not only rifling through my files, but actually investigated my mother, a well-known subversive. <laughs> funny, it would be funny if it's not so pathetic. As an American citizen, I am outraged outrage the report prompted calls for an independent investigation we are asking for this investigation because the state department should not be an arm of the negative research team of the republican national committee or the bush campaign 
Bush campaign spokesman had nothing to add. But as the president struggles these last two weeks, reports of an investigation of Bill Clinton's mother would seem the last thing he needs. The island of Navaya Zemlya might be a bleak and barren place inside the Arctic Circle, 2,000 kilometers north of Moscow, but for decades, business mushroomed until two years ago when Russia stopped nuclear testing in the area. You'd think the people who lived there would be happy it was all over, but that's not the case at all. The 10,000 soldiers and their families assigned here, the Air Force fighter squadron based here, have one common mission. Even the children know what their parents do. They blow things up. For almost 40 years, Novaya Zemlya has been Russia's nuclear testing ground. But a moratorium on testing has meant the tundra hasn't shaken here for the past two years. And the military doesn't like it. Two years of silence, says Captain Viktor Kuryagin, means two years of falling behind. For the first time this past week, the military skittishly opened the island to Western journalists. Don't film here, the officer pleaded. They have reason to be nervous. Russia recently admitted that off the coast, the Soviet military dumped damaged nuclear reactors and thousands of barrels of nuclear waste. When the Greenpeace ship Solo attempted to approach Novaya Zemlya last week to monitor radiation levels, the Russian Navy boarded the ship and towed it away. To prove the island is safe, the military brought out their Geiger counters, proudly pointing to radiation levels lower than Moscow. Families here insist there is nothing to fear. It's not scary, Masha says. We've lived through it. So the islanders, already accustomed to waiting out the winter, will wait out the moratorium. It can't last forever, said one officer. Novia Zemlya wants to be ground zero again. Movie star Michael Caine has had some toffee-nosed roles playing the proper English officer and gentleman. He's also played the rascal and battler, roles closer to his own roots in the back streets of London. Mr. Kane is in Australia for the release of the book on his life story. Mark Ferguson went along. If you have the history, you may recall this elegant soldier in the movie that made the man Zulu. Who said you could use my man? The demure Michael Kane is now the elegant veteran. Today he made his Australian debut. Welcome to Australia. <laughs> It's taken 59 years in this long-awaited autobiography to lure Mr. Kane down under. There's even a taped version narrated by the man himself. So what I wanted to do was eventually was to sort of put the record straight on my own record player. A written record that's shot to number one in Britain. The author knows there's heated competition on the local front. And I've got great timing. I come out the same week as Madonna, who all she does is take her knickers and bra off and I'm, I'm in the toilet, you know? It's a story that stretches from the lows of London's East End to the heights of fame, from a man who's never forgotten his Cockney beginnings, nor the Australian connection. And if you think that they were convicts uh, who came here first, if any was, anybody was going to be a convict from London, it would have been my lot. I mean... 200 years too late, this Cockney hit the harbour. The latest quest to answer, what's it all about? It's something my mother once said. She said, you must remember you are no better than anybody else. And by the same token, nobody is any better than you. May the best man win. Mark Ferguson for Nightline. Coming up after the break, the latest in sport and how true love won through in the end. <laughs> Now some sport and the big race in Melbourne this weekend is the Cox Plate. And this year it's got the strongest field in the history of the event. Between them, the 14 runners have won $28 million. But for many punters, Let's Elope is the sentimental favourite. Trainers Lee Friedman and John Wheeler are living proof that all's fair in love and war. <laughs> well, almost. Friedman has favourite naturalism and today at the pre-race media conference rated the four-year-old in top form for the race of his life. The fact that it's run at Mooney Valley is just an added bonus because he's, he's such a great horse at Mooney Valley. It's just, you'd, you'd think he was trained there the way he races there. With today's fine and warm weather, the prospect of a good track tomorrow is a real possibility, improving many of the runners' chances in the Cox Plate tomorrow. 
The conditions will suit champion Kiwi galloper Ruff Habis, who will be out to avenge last year's seventh place. His best performances have been on good tracks. Also elated with the conditions, Bart Cummings. His supermare Let's Elope has thrived this week. They say it's a race for champions. I agree with that. She's certainly a champion and it's only fitting that she should win it. Naturalism is a 7-4 to four favourite to win with three-year-old Coronation Day second pick ahead of Let's Elope. Channel 9 will show the Cox Plate live tomorrow at 5-4. to four. An ankle injury has forced Great Britain Rugby League fullback Graham Stedman. Out of tomorrow's World Cup final against Australia at Wembley, he's been replaced by Joe Lydon. But there were no worries for the Australians, who arrived in London for training on one of the most famous paddocks in the world. Fitting giants Paul Sirenen and Glenn Lazarus into a hotel lift was the first obstacle the team faced on arriving in London. Glenn was far happier on the hallowed turf at Wembley the major hurdle the Australians face in tomorrow night's sellout. After 90 experience, we won't get overawed by the, the situation here again. I'm, 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 I'm really looking forward to come back here and play again. Wembley's big occasion atmosphere swapped the Aussies and lifted England two years ago in the first test. What a try! Oh, unbelievable! Undefeated on two previous kangaroo tours, the 1912 win by England sparked almost unprecedented euphoria. But Meninga says they now know what to expect, and he's happy with the side's homework. I've got no doubts at all that we're going to handle the conditions. I've got no doubts about our fitness, our time and our skill. Uh, I think that um, our preparation's been excellent. Although solid, England does have several question marks over the defence capabilities in the backs, and the ability of Sean Edwards to shut down sidestepping Brad Fittler and Derek Fox to keep Alan Langer in check. Derek Fox at halfback, I mean, fair dinkum. Uh... Ray Warren have beat him over 40 metres. What's not in doubt is Martin O'Fire's speed, easily the fastest winger in the world. He and Ellery Hanley are the two players Australian coach Bob Fulton has earmarked for special attention. Ken Sutcliffe, Nightline. The Atlanta Braves are back in the race for baseball's World Series after beating the Toronto Blue Jays 7-2 in Toronto today. And they did it with the help of a whopper. Toronto's Sky Dome was all dressed up for the ritual hijack of American baseball. But from the top of the fourth inning, the Braves had the series on the midnight plane back to Georgia. Nearly into the second deck. Atlanta went ahead 3-2 in the fifth, and with bases loaded, Toronto pitcher Jack Morris fastballed Lonnie Smith. High in the air and well hit to right field. Carter to the wall. Grand slam, Lonnie Smith. Smith whacked the first World Series Grand Slam in four years, increasing the Braves' lead to 7-2. The Blue Jays lead the best of seven series 3-2, coverage on nine at 12.25 tomorrow morning. Tim Sheridan, Nightline. For most of us these days, it's hard to think of lovers being torn apart because of religious differences. But 60 years ago, being a Welsh non-conformist meant being wary of men who were Christian scientists. Eleanor Griffiths met Basil Tight 60 years ago when they were in their 20s and she was a trainee teacher. But Eleanor's mother broke up the romance because of Basil's religious persuasion. Still crazy about him after all these years, Eleanor wrote to a Lonely Hearts magazine. Basil, recently widowed, was soon in touch, popped the question, and today they tied the knot. Finance now, and the Australian share market rose today, the All Ordinaries gaining seven points. In Tokyo, the Nikkei was also up, gaining 104 points. In London tonight, the FT100 continues to rise, this time by 12 points. Gold is a few cents stronger at $343.55 an ounce. And in European trading tonight, the Australian dollar is buying 71.88 US cents, one Deutschmark, 87 yen and 44p. The national weather and an anti-cyclone covers eastern Australia, while a weak cold front over the bite will reach the continent in the next day or two. It will be followed by a high-pressure cell. The forecasts, an overnight storm in Darwin, fine in Brisbane, clear as well in Sydney, Canberra, Melbourne, Hobart and Adelaide. Perth won't miss the good weather, it's going to be fine there as well. The current weather patterns are playing havoc with the seas off Sydney. In fact, you'd have to be brave or a little silly to go anywhere near the surf, 
Beaches were closed between Wanda and Cronulla and between Freshwater and Whale Beach. Four metre swells were reported at Sydney Heads. Out to sea, they reached seven metres. Well, this week we've seen the Coalition's new industrial relations policy being thrashed back and forth with scare tactics playing a big part. Opponents have hinted we'll see children pulling coal carts if the opposition gets into power. The Coalition acts as though John Howard's plan is the only way to save the country from economic destruction. Brian Dore pins down Mr Howard to sort out the facts. Mr Howard, thanks for your time tonight. Well, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. You've been out selling your industrial relations policy this week. Yes, indeed. The Jobs Back package going very well, too. Yes, why is it called Jobs Back? I don't know. I didn't ask. Do you perhaps want to ask me something relevant, or are we going to have well, a discussion? Well, how does it work? How does it work? Yeah. Beautifully. No, I mean, I mean <clears throat> what's its purpose? Oh, its purpose, of course, is to stop the country from being held to ransom by the power of big unions. Why, in our view, should a prospective employee be told what he can and can't accept by some thug in a union 2,000 miles away? Yes, but Mr Howard, doesn't that mean he's going to be told what to do by a thug in a suit 20,000 miles away? But for heaven's sake, the thug in the suit, the very competent executive involved, is paying for this harmless idiot's wage. But shouldn't we make sure that he's paying him properly, that, he, uh, that he's got health and safety protection? Oh, should we wake him for meals, do you think, as well? The point My point making. is that it is absolutely none of anyone else's concern what is agreed to between two parties in the contract. So the worker's got no protection and no option? Oh, he's got an option. He doesn't have to take the job. Yeah, but he wants the job. Of course he wants the job. So he'll accept what he gets? Well, not always, no. Why not? Because well, he's not always going to get it. But you're missing my point. Well, look, give us an example. Mr Howard, for example, let's take Joe Bloggs, and he wants a, a job at Ford. Righto. I mean, how does he negotiate his wage and conditions? Well, he obviously speaks to Ford. He rings up and speaks to Mr... Um, Ford? Mr Ford, I what, guess. What, in America? Yeah. Well, does he want the job or doesn't he? Well, of course he does, but... Well, you know... he rings up and he says, Bloggs is my name. You probably don't know me. We've quite possibly never met. I'm calling from Australia. I'm interested in securing a position screwing left back doors on in your plant in Altona. And what does Mr Ford say? Well, he's a very busy man, Mr Ford. He might flick Brother Joseph down at the corporate legal division. And what do they do? Oh, a bit of light-hearted haggling and possibly engage his services. And this will anyway. go on all the time Not with all every the time, individual no, worker? Not all the time, season of the year, part of the what year. What season? A part of the year specially put aside for enterprise bargaining. An enterprise bargaining enterprise season? Enterprise bargaining season, yeah. And during uh, which uh, people will go out and engage the services of employees. Using what? Well, enterprise bargaining equipment. I don't know, whistles, flares, well, what decoys. What sort of enterprise bargaining and equipment? And proper enterprise bargaining equipment. Well, what sort? 12 gauge. So what will you do if you want a job? Just go out in the street and wait till you hear the sound of gunfire. And then what do you do? If you want a job, yeah. put your head up. John Clark and Brian Dorr. Just a reminder that daylight saving begins in New South Wales, the ACT, Victoria and South Australia on Sunday morning. So in those states, you put your clocks forward one hour before you go to bed. Of course, Queensland, Western Australia and the Northern Territory have no daylight saving. And that's all from us here at Nightline for the week. We'll be back on Monday again with the latest news of the day. We'll leave you with the panda bear triplets just born in China. Good night.